that we need to talk about in this chapter is intermolecular forces. So there was a lot in this chapter, but it all kind of goes together. Um, so we talked about covalent compounds. We talked about how to draw Lewis structures for covalent compounds. We talked about how the shapes work. We talked about polarity. Now we're going to talk about intermolecular forces. Okay? Um, and that's, like I said, that's kind of the last thing. So just so you know, um, I'm thinking that most likely our test is going to be Friday of this week. All right? <laughs> well, how convenient. No, um, so Friday of, of this week, just plan on that. I'll try to get you the study guide by tomorrow um, so that you can get ready. Honestly, you should have a pretty good idea of what's going to be on this one. It's basically just a lot of, uh, you know, Lewis structures, what's the shape, what's the polarity, that sort of stuff. Okay? Um, oh, this is a bad plan. Here, let me scroll down quite a bit in the notes here before I... So that's steeper. Intermolecular forces. There we go. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about liquids and solids as we go through this um, and, and how intermolecular forces uh, work out there. Now, when I say intermolecular, this is important. I'm going to say this a lot today. Um, because this is a place where students always get confused. Okay? I want to be really, really clear about what an intermolecular force is and is not. Okay? Um, so when I write NaCl, that's a chemical formula, right? And remember how we talked about with, uh, well, what kind of bond is that, first of all? Ionic or covalent? Okay, are we in agreement there? metal and a non-metal, so this is going to be ionic, right? There's going to be a complete transfer of electrons from one thing to another, okay? So the way this looks in, in actuality, I don't know why I used that word just now, sorry about that. Um, so it's a one sodium surrounded by several chlorines, and then you've got a chlorine surrounded by several sodiums, you know, and it just keeps going out in a big cube structure kind of like that, okay? Um, that's an ionic compound. Now, these things are attracted to one another. This Na plus and this Cl minus are attracted to each other by what's called an ionic bond, okay? I want to be very clear, that is not an intermolecular force. Ionic bond is not an intermolecular force, all right? You need to understand that. Now, let me show you one other thing that is not an intermolecular force. CO2, carbon dioxide, okay? What kind of bond is that? Covalent. By the way, anytime I draw lines between two elements, you can know that's a covalent bond because that means they're sharing electrons, okay? So this right here, this bond, not an intermolecular force, okay? That is a sharing of electrons. So when I say intermolecular, uh, well, maybe a good way, okay, so when I say interstate highway, what does that mean? It's a highway that goes through several states, okay? It goes between different states, okay? So an intermolecular force is a force between different molecules, okay? Different states, different molecules. Does that make sense? All right? So this right here, this is a force within a molecule, inside of a molecule, okay? Um, they don't usually call it this, but that would technically be an intrastate highway, right? a highway that is only in one state, and it doesn't go into another state. Does that make sense? So think interstate highway. That might help you with intermolecular force. I'm going to keep coming back to that, though, because that's the one thing that confuses students with this more than anything else. Okay? Intermolecular forces. So here's what they actually are, now that I've told you what they're not. Well, okay, we've got to talk about a couple other things first, I guess. Um, so phase is the homogeneous part of a system in contact with other parts, but separated? Yeah. You know what, I don't care if you know that. So you can write that down. You don't have to write that down. I don't really care. OK? Um, this example right here, there are two phases there. Okay, There's a solid phase, which is the ice, and then there's a liquid phase, which is the water. Okay, 
Um, so that's a phase. But again, I, I never use that terminology, so you really don't need to worry about that. Um, but these intermolecular forces actually have a lot to do with the, um, the states of matter, OK? So we've, have we talked about gases, liquids, and solids in here this year? OK, I thought we did a little bit. So you already know this. This is a review, OK? A gas is compressible. It has very free motion. Um, liquid, uh, they're slightly more attracted to each other, OK? And then a solid, they're very attracted to each other, so those particles stay in place. It's all about attraction between the molecules. Okay, so that's, that's why we're talking about this when we talk about intermolecular forces. So an intermolecular force, here we go. Attractive forces between molecules, all right? How attracted is one molecule for another molecule? Um, there are a lot of things in our world that work because of intermolecular forces. Actually, I've got one on my desk right here. Glue stick, right? So what I do when I put the glue on here, when that dries, it actually, because of the intermolecular forces between the glue and whatever it's sticking to, okay, because of those forces between the molecules of attraction, they stick together. Okay? That's how all adhesives work, any tape, anything like that. Um, that's why water does what it does, which we're actually going to do a lab um, that talks about why water likes to stick to itself and sometimes to other things, just depending, okay? So um, intermolecular forces actually explain a lot, okay? Intramolecular forces hold the atoms together in a molecule. So that's what I just told you, okay? Inter is between molecules, between states, an interstate highway, okay? Intra, uh, that holds the atoms together in the molecule, all right? So that's within one molecule itself. So intermolecular versus intramolecular. Um, intramolecular forces are going to be much weaker than intramolecular forces. Okay? So the example here, um, if you wanted to vaporize a mole of water, what do I mean when I say vaporize? Yeah, make it into a gas. Okay? Which, I, I don't know, you guys may be too, um, too young to remember this, but uh, probably none of you watched Looney Tunes cartoons with Marvin the Martian, and he likes to vaporize things, you know. He's just turning them into gas is all he's doing. It's not that big a deal, okay. Um, well, I mean, it's kind of a big deal. If you're supposed to be a solid and you get turned into a gas, that's not good. Um, but... To vaporize water, to turn it into a gas, it takes about 41 kilojoules of energy. That's a measure of energy, okay? You don't need to really know how big or how small a kilojoule is, but you can tell it takes a lot more energy to break the OH bonds in a mole of water, okay? So you might want to draw this on your paper. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to draw this in the simplest way possible. So we've got some water molecules, all right? Well, here, let's, let's actually draw them correctly here. And we can actually talk about this now. That's the shape of a water molecule. Now, how do I know that's the shape of a water molecule? Just looking at the Lewis structure. Okay, there are two non-bonding domains, right? So there are four total domains, which would normally be tetrahedral. But because two of those are non-bonding, they push everything down, and you end up with this bent structure. You remember the bent shape that we talked about? Okay. So that's, that's a water molecule, all right? Polar or nonpolar, by the way? That's going to be very polar, right? Okay, because it's completely not symmetrical. So if it's polar, that means that one end is negative, one end is positive, okay? Now, any guesses on which end is negative here? Which end of that molecule do you think has more electrons or pulls the electrons closer to itself? Probably the oxygen, right? Okay, and if you, if you want to, you can look at your electronegativity chart, and it would show you, okay, oxygen's definitely the more negative of the two, okay? Hydrogen just can't pull the electrons that close to itself. So if you were labeling this, this would be the negative end. Remember the little soup ladles? And this would be the positive end of the molecule, okay? 
Um, I'm not sure I want to do that right now. I just want to show that to you, okay? So if this is the negative end, that means that this end is going to be attracted to other water molecules, the positive end of other water molecules, right? So let's say another water molecule comes along, and you've got uh, something like this. And there's a little bit of attraction right there, okay? That hydrogen, which is positively charged, is attracted to the negatively charged oxygen. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's the difference. In order to change water into a gas, I have to break this. Does that make sense? I have to break the bond between the water molecules because the water molecules, the reason they're a liquid is because they're attracted to each other, so they kind of stick together. Okay? To change something to a gas, you have to completely break those attractions. But it's still water up in the atmosphere, right? Okay? It's still H2O. It's just individual H2O molecules. It's not H2O stuck together. Okay? Now, what do you think I'd have to do to make uh, water into ice? Say that again. Well, you'd have to freeze it, right? But what's going to happen to these intermolecular forces when I freeze the water? They're actually going to get stronger. Does that make sense? Okay, so the waters are then held more tightly in place. Okay, so it's actually a really strong bond that way, okay? Um, now, the only way that I can do an intramolecular, uh, break an intramolecular bond here, is to break one of these. In an individual water molecule, to pull a hydrogen off of an oxygen, that's breaking a covalent bond. Do, do you guys see the difference between those two? Does that make sense? Okay, this is intermolecular, it's between two water molecules. This is intramolecular. That's within the water molecule itself, if I'm breaking that one, okay? Now, watch this. You excited? It's going to blow your minds. Probably not. Ready? Physical change. Chemical change. See how that works? Okay. That's why earlier in the year we talked about the fact that when you boil water, that's not a chemical change. That's just a physical change because all I'm doing is I'm separating the water molecules from one another. Okay? To do a chemical change, I have to actually break the water molecule itself apart. Okay? So you guys see the distinction there? Okay. So that's, hopefully that helps a little bit, but that's the intra, uh, intra versus intermolecular thing. Okay? And it's a little tricky, so if you're struggling with that, come talk to me about it, because I, I know that's tough. Whoops. As always, I wrote something where there was something else. Uh, so a lot of times, if you want to measure the strength of the intermolecular forces, you measure the boiling point, okay? Um, so, well, and I'm not sure if I want to go there yet. Boiling point or the melting point, uh, this is called the delta H of vaporization, delta H of fusion. I don't care that you know that. I think it's on your sheet, isn't it? But it says D, H of vaporization, D, H of fusion. I don't care that you know those terms, really. Or delta H of sublimation, which sublimation, do we know what that is? Did we talk about that already this year? Last year you talked about it? Sublimation is basically just going from a solid directly to a gas, which you've actually looked at something this year that does that. What was it? Dry yeah, the dry ice. Okay. Okay. So, now we need to talk about the types of intermolecular forces because there are several types. Okay. The first one is dipole-dipole. Okay. That's the attractive force between polar molecules. So, if you have two polar molecules, this is the way that they're attracted to one another. Okay? Um, an example of that is water. I just showed you an example of that. Um, what's another polar molecule that we talked about? We talked about PCL3, didn't we? Um, before we took the quiz. So PCL3, let me draw the Lewis structure for that. Okay? And actually there's a...
Now again, I, I don't care all that much that you can label the positive and the negative into this molecule, um, but uh, this is going to be kind of a trigonal pyramidal shape, right? These are kind of going to kind of be, you have to envision them in three dimensions kind of down below the phosphorus, and then you've got your lone pair up at the top, okay? Um, in this particular instance, the chlorines are more electronegative than the phosphorus, so down at the bottom of that molecule is going to be a little bit more negative. And at the top, where the phosphorus is, that's going to be a little bit more positive, okay? Now, again, I don't care that you can label the positive and the negative end of the molecule. I'm just telling you that so that I can show you something here, okay? Um, so if I'm talking about the intermolecular forces, what I have to do is I have to draw another TCl3 molecule, maybe up here. Okay, and because this part is a little bit positive and this part is a little bit negative, this is actually going to be attracted to that. Does that make sense? Positive ends attracted to the negative end. Okay, so that's an intermolecular force between two PCl3 molecules, and that's called the dipole-dipole force because this is a polar bond. Okay, this is a polar molecule. This is a polar molecule, so they have dipole-dipole attraction for one another. Everybody okay with that? Again, I know this is this is a lot that I'm throwing at you here, and what you actually have to do with this is not so bad. Um, okay, so here's an example. Polar molecules in a solid. Um, you're going to have the positive ends and the negative ends kind of sticking to one another, okay? Um, so you can see how this is oriented. So you've got negative next to positive and then negative next to positive, right? Positive next to negative. So there's never a negative next to another negative. Have you ever tried to put the, um, the negative ends of magnets together? If you think about them being negative and positive ends, what happens? They, they push apart from each other, right? You can't do it, okay? So that's, that's why these molecules, when they're allowed to just orient themselves however they want to, the negatives always go next to, next to the positives, and the positives always go next to the negatives, okay? So then you've got those, we would call these, right here, the dipole-dipole interactions, okay? Dipole-dipole forces, which, again, you could also draw it this way because these are attracted to each other as well. So when you have a solid, that's what holds it all together, okay? Um, I'm trying to kind of think, show you examples as we go through this. So... Well, okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Hang on. Some polar molecules contain what's called permanent dipoles, or regions that are always partially negative and partially positive, okay? Um, I don't know why it says some polar molecules. That's, that's what polar molecules have, is that um, negative and positive end, okay? So then the attractions between those regions is called dipole-dipole. Do you guys have anything to fill out here? Yeah, okay. I should have the notes in front of me, but I don't today. Um, and then these molecules orient themselves so that the oppositely charged regions line up. We showed you a picture of that on the last page. And multiple attached, obviously you can have, you know, a whole network of these things that are attached to one another, okay? And these forces are stronger than dispersion forces, only if the mass of the compounds are nearly the same. That means nothing to you. It doesn't need to mean anything to you. Don't, don't even worry about that. Do you even have a blank for that? Okay. Yeah, so it's on there. Uh, you can write next to it that you don't really need to know that. Okay. Um, so an example, again, is hydrogen chloride, HCl molecules, either solid or liquid. So if you've got HCl... Now, this one's really easy to figure out, okay? Polar or nonpolar? Um, so this is in a line, right? This is a linear shape. Um, but they're two different molecules. So remember our rule, if you've got different molecules around the central atom. Now, there really is no central atom here. But the molecules are different. The atoms are different. So then this is going to be polar, right? Anybody see that? Can you guess which one is the negative end on this one? 
Yeah, the chlorine's more electronegative than the hydrogen, so this is going to be your negative end. This is going to be your positive end. Okay? So then, if you've got another HCl over here, again, positive end, negative end. Well, the positive and the negatives are attracted to one another, so then you have an attraction right there. That's a dipole-dipole attraction. Make sense? Okay. And here's another way that you can draw that, okay? So solid and liquid um, in any polar molecule, really, okay? Um, and instead of, instead of showing the partial positive and partial negative I've been showing, it's just showing the, the arrows, the way that they're drawn, okay? All right, so that's, that's one type of um, intermolecular force is dipole-dipole, okay? Now, there's a special type of intermolecular force called hydrogen bonding. This is really important. This is especially important if you're going to any other uh, biological or chemical class that we have at this school. You're going to need to know about hydrogen bonding. Some of you who have already taken some of the Project Lead the Way classes, you've talked about hydrogen bonding quite a bit at this point. Okay? Um, so hydrogen bonding is one special type of dipole-dipole. So it's kind of like a subcategory of the dipole-dipole. <coughs> Okay? Uh, this attraction is going to occur between molecules that have a hydrogen bonded to N, O, or F. I think, is that, yeah, there we go. Fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Actually, this is a good way to, uh, to have it ordered. Hydrogen bonding is fawn. Fawn? It's fawn, which sort of sounds like fawn, right? Hydrogen bonding is fawn. So you can remember fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen. Those are the three atoms that when they bond with a hydrogen, you have hydrogen bonding, okay? Um, I think we're probably going to have to cover the rest of this starting tomorrow. How much more is on this slide? Oh, man, a lot. Okay, yeah, we'll cover the rest of this tomorrow, okay? And no, don't worry about a homework quiz for tonight. There's really no homework to give you at this point. We've got to get through the rest of the notes.